Okay. Now that you've learned how to set up Dead Man's Doubloons, we are going to show you a little bit about how to play the game. Granted, uh, full explanation can be found in the rulebook, which is linked to inside of Tabletop Simulator in the notebook here, as well as in the Steam Workshop game entry for Dead Man's Doubloons. Uh, as the game begins, everyone's going to draw from the main deck five cards up to their hand size. Uh, one of the ships has a special ability, which is uh, this blue one here, experienced. It says at the top, uh, hand size plus one. So they actually start with six. So every other player will draw five. Gonna right click on the deck, draw, draw, draw. And of course, me as the blue player, I get to draw six cards. Everyone else will draw five. Uh, every turn, the first thing that every uh, player does simultaneously is choose cards from their hand kind of zoom in on them, uh, to uh, program your order for the turn. You're going to choose three cards, and you're going to place them face down. Let's say the first one I'm going to do is that one, then the second one is going to be this one, and the third one, this one. Chose them for a reason, you'll see. So I've chosen my three actions for the turn. Each other player does the same, places theirs face down in front of them. Once all players have placed their three cards down, we begin the round. Whoever has the initiative is the first to go. Let's say it's me. Everyone simultaneously reveals their first card, their first action card. So now that everyone has revealed the first action, I uh, have the initiative, so I'm going to take my first turn. And looking at the cards, the first thing that happens is the navigation at the top of the card indicates uh, what type of movement I do with my ship. In this case, I have a turn signal only, a turn symbol. It's a come about. And it's solid blue, meaning I have to do it. Um, if you look at this card, for example, you'll see this has a forward arrow, uh, or it points to the right, but that basically means my ship will sail forward uh, in a straight, uh, straight, you know, straight line to the next area. And it's dotted line uh, around it, the dotted outline, it's gray. That is an optional movement for me. But here, I have no choice but to come about. So my ship comes about, turns around the other way. Then I have two action choices on the card. I choose one of those two to execute. Uh, in this case, I have pillage or broadside. Well, broadside would work great if I was in an area with other ships, because everyone else in the area would take two damage. Uh, there is nobody in my area, so instead, I'm going to pillage. And pillage says, take a pillage token, place it in front of you. This doesn't do anything yet. At the end of the round, we check to see who has the most pillage strength, and they will be able to take some doubloons from the island. That's it for me. Now the red player goes, then green, then yellow. And just for the sake of some interesting dynamics, let's say yellow has moved there, and green's moved there, and they all did some things on their own. Now we get back to me, and it's now time to, for every player to flip the second action. Now in this case, I have no movement at the top, uh, but I have some very powerful abilities. The first is I can pillage uh, with a plus one strength, so meaning I can actually get two of these instead of just one as normal. Uh, or I can hunt for the buried treasure, uh, which is really the magic of the game. That hunt symbol, or that map symbol on the bottom there, does one of uh, two or three things, depending on the state of the game. At the very beginning, it's common, in this case, where every player has the one map fragment piece that they uh, drew during setup. In this case, I have a Path of the Cutlass. And there's a stack of map tiles up here, six map tiles. Well, when you do not have two map fragments or more, this symbol means draw one uh, tile from the stack, if there are any. So I'm going to do that. I draw one tile from the stack, and I flip it. And in this case, it's another map uh, fragment. In this case, the Skull's Gaze. Uh, so I now have two map fragments. So in a later round, if I were to play that icon, it's going to do something different. And we'll see that in a little bit. All right, everyone else does their actions. Let's say some more of these are getting, you know, getting handed out. These other players are, are doing their own things. They're moving around. They're shooting people. People are taking damage. Let's just say uh, someone shot at me from... Maybe green shot at me using a front attack, which hits the next area, hits all ships in the next area for one. So now the round gets back to me. It's time to flip the third action, which is this. 
and I'm going to zoom in and show you here. So the first thing, as always, is I have to do the movement. Now, in this, because they're blue and solid, I have to do those. But I can choose the order. <clears throat> so I have to move and I have to come about. So I can either move forward to this area and then come about. Or I can stay where I am. I can come about first and then move forward, which would put me in this area. For the purposes of demonstration, I want to show you some interactions. So I am going to move forward and then come about. So I'm up here with green now. So that's the navigation. And once again, <coughs> excuse me, I can do one of two actions here. The first one shown is a front attack, which I mentioned earlier, uh, allows you to hit every ship in the next area that I'm facing for one damage. So I'd hit yellow for one. Well, that's not interesting enough for me at the moment because I have a better, uh, more interesting choice, which is the second one is a boarding action. There are several different types of boarding actions. In this case, the boarding action says steal half doubloons. Boarding actions work like this. They affect only ships in your area. So in this case, I can attack green. Let's say green took some damage. That'll be important. Uh, so I am able to board green because they're in the same area as me as long as they have taken any damage, which is why I just pretended to move him down by one. Uh, if a ship has no damage on it, it is immune to boarding. So in this case, here's my card, uh, I can board green ship and steal half their doubloons round down. Um, there's one other element there, which is a lot of the boarding actions have a pre-requirement. So in this case, it says previous has a picture of a card with a doubloon symbol or a pillage symbol on it. That means that one of my prior cards has to have that symbol on it. Well, in this case, that card does and this card does. So I meet that requirement, no problem. I meet the requirement. I'm in an area with a damaged ship. I can steal half of Green's doubloons round out, which in this case is only one, but you can imagine later on in the game that gets pretty impressive. All right. Uh, everyone finishes their actions for the round, and we come to the pillage phase. Well, as we showed earlier, we were collecting these pillage tokens. Um, these happen now after all of the players have taken their actions, we have a pillage round. What we do is we compare who has the most pillage tokens. Right now I have one, and let's say the other players have none. So I have the most, and I am now going to be able to take that many doubloons from the island. In this case, just one. All right. Uh, these other two in this scenario would remain on the island, and the next turn we're going to add another three because we're in a four-player game. So this pot keeps growing, as you can see. I give this back because it's now the end of this round. I have to get rid of all my pillage tokens. Next round I can fight for uh, pillaging again. What you will find happens, though, is I might have collected, let's say... Uh, two pillage tokens during the round. Yellow's collected one. Green, uh, red's collected, let's say, two. And green's collected none. So we have a smattering of uh, different amounts out there. Maybe some player gets three or four pillage tokens. So we get to the end of the round. We look who has the most. Red and blue have the most with two each. They each get two from the island. And then who has the next most? Yellow. Yellow has one. There's enough left. Yellow gets the one. And that's how that works. Now, if there's never enough to pay out an entire group of players who happen to be tied for the most, or the second most, or whatever, then they get none, and everything remains on the island. All right. Actually, I, a slight correction. I apologize. Slight correction to that. Uh, if there are tied players and there's not enough, uh, they get as much as possible from the island split evenly. So if there's enough to pay, let's say, one each, but not two each, that's fine. They each get one each, and then whatever's left stays on the island. Um, that's the majority of the rounds in the game. Then there's some special cases. Um, let's say that uh, one of the captains had reached the Skull Mountain. Uh, I haven't shown you this yet, the, the uh, moving on the island, because we haven't seen the scenario where a player has two map fragments. Uh, but once a player reaches the Skull Mountain here at the end, uh, they are going to trigger the digging up of the, uh, of the buried treasure. Uh, everyone that is in the vicinity is going to get some jewels, 
and then all the captains come back to their ship. So that's something that you check at the end of the round. Uh, in this case, we don't have that yet. I'm going to go for one more round because I want to show you a couple more uh, dynamics. Everyone will discard all the cards that they have collected from the previous round and then draw back up to their hand size. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that um, as you lose crew, which can happen by taking damage from, from attacks, some of the crew spots here will reduce your hand size. So by losing that first crew, I have uh, one fewer hand size. Then the next spot, if I lose that crew, that removes my ship's special, which in the case of blue is just an, another hand size. Uh, the third one reduces yet another hand size, and the fourth one actually prevents my ship's ability to come about. I don't have enough crew to man the sails and the masts and all that, uh, so all I can do is, is sail in a straight line kind of around the island. But I have all my crew at the moment. Put them back. So we've drawn our cards for the next round. Everyone's oh, before that we actually pass the initiative to the next player on the in clockwise order. So in this case, uh, red will go first next time. But we all simultaneously choose. Now I have two map fragments, and I really want to show you what happens when uh, when we when we use those. So I'm definitely going to choose this uh, action here, which has a map fragment symbol on the top or hunt symbol. And then, of course, it allows me to steal a map fragment from another pirate on the bottom in case I needed that. So I'm going to drag that one out as number one. And maybe I'll get lucky and be able to do it two times in a row. That depends on how the other players play. And maybe uh, maybe in the last round I'll want to repair because maybe I'll have taken some damage or possibly be able to shoot. So uh, I'll choose that one as my third action. All right. Uh, the round begins. Red starts. We all flip action one. Uh, I'm just going to speed this along here so we get all the way around to my turn. And first thing that happens is I do my optional movement. Uh, I am going to, um, yep, I'm going to move forward and come about. So that is my new positioning. And then I'm going to do the hunt symbol. Well, the hunt symbol means, in this case, I have two map fragments. So instead of drawing from the tile stack, I actually get to move my captain on the path, on one of the paths towards the buried treasure. So look in the island, and you will see that there are actually three different paths, distinct areas that I can go. Starting from the island here, I can uh, travel along the coast path over here, which are the blue dots, and that leads ultimately up to the Skull Mountain after one, two, three, four stops. The blue path is kind of the safest path. What you will find, which are these tiles here, the coastal path. Uh, there are um, lots of friendly little tribes and villages where you can kind of get uh, hire some crew back, uh, possibly repair your ship a little bit, things like that. The yellow path in the middle uh, is one, two. Once I get here, I have to either go over to the cursed path briefly or over to the coastal path. If I go to the coastal path and I go three, four, from here I can stay on the coastal or go back to the to the yellow path in the middle. So you'll see that there's these forking, branching uh, paths, and I can kind of make these choices. If I hop over to the red path, then from there I can you know, either hit one more red path to get up or hop back to the yellow. Uh, and lastly, and the yellow path, by the way, is the Valley of Riches. So here there's going to be more opportunity for finding doubloons, uh, uh, gaining fame, uh, actually not gaining fame, that happens in the blue path, uh, but uh, getting map pieces, and uh, possibly even drawing a jewel from the pile of jewels. And then the red path over here, of course, is the Cursed Passage. Now, if I start right on the Cursed Passage path, that's one, two, three to get there. So that's the shortest path to get up to the Skull Mountain, but it's the most dangerous. So I get to choose which path I want to go on. Um, so I'm the captain. Uh, I'm using the hunt symbol. I have two map fragments, so I can pursue any path that I want. Um, what I have to tell everyone at the table <clears throat> is which of these two I am going to follow, which map fragment I'm going to follow. For the sake of demonstration, I'm going to say that I follow the Skull's Gaze uh, map fragment that I have. The reason that's important is because every other player who has the same map fragment type, in this case red, he will also get to advance his captain after I do. 
This adds a very unique di uh, dimension to the game where who has what map fragments really matters. Uh, yellow over here, look at yellow. Yellow has two of the uh, parrot types. Um, red and blue do not, but green has one of those as well. So if yellow were to advance, he only has one choice. Every time he advances, the green player is actually going to follow and, uh, and, and move as well. Now later on, uh, let's say red says, well, I don't like that. Every time yellow moves, green gets to move. So he's going to try to steal that, you know, that parrot. Now red has all the options. Uh, of course, in this case, green has none. Then later on, green comes down and, and, and steals my cutlass because nobody else has a cutlass in this game. And therefore, uh, it's unique. And at the moment, at least, there might be more in the, in the tile stack here. And so now anytime green uses the cutlass to advance, no one's going to follow. You'll see that these dynamics come out and emerge uh, pretty quickly. Um, so, again, for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to say that I follow the Skull's Gaze path. And I'm going, or not path, but map fragment. And I am going to embark, let's say, on the Valley of Riches. I'm going to keep it uh, kind of middle of the road at this point. It's the longest path, but it has the most potential gain. Uh, I move there. There is no tile drawn yet for this spot, so I draw from the appropriate stack after I shuffle it. One of these tiles, put it there, flip it, and I lucked out. Uh, I got one of the few tiles that actually says I can gain a jewel. In this case, it says I can return one doubloon to the island to gain a jewel. I'll put my guy on it. Uh, so that's well worth it. So I will put one of my doubloons back on the island, and what I get to do is draw from the bag of jewels. So I'm going to draw one out. I drew the weakest jewel, but it's still worth three at the end of the game. That's Amethyst. Any other player who moves to the same spot will get to do that as well. So I've moved. Uh, I followed that map fragment. Now everyone else who has that map fragment can move. So Red can move his uh, Captain Pawn as well. Now he can choose to go anywhere he wants. Um, he can say, I don't really care about that. Of course, he'd be stupid too. In this case, there's no reason Red would not go there and also draw a jewel, uh, who also happens to draw Amethyst, which is the most common, by the way. But there are diamonds and... Uh, and um, rubies and so on. Um, but let's say uh, let's say later on in the game, green moves and green's really damaged and says, you know what, I, I I'm going to go the safe path. I don't want to take any extra time. So uh, later on, green moves up to uh, the blue path, and so we'll draw that one. And this one says you can return doubloon to the island to gain two crew. So it's like you're hiring some crew from a mercenary camp or something. Uh, so that's how these tiles are laid out. Every time you go to a spot that has no tile, you draw one, flip it, place it. So if red had moved there before anyone else, red would be able to just simply gain a doubloon from the island in that case. That's how those work. Um, okay, so the hunt action happened. Uh, we keep going around, flip the next one. I get to hunt again. Let's say I keep moving forward. Uh, later on, I might choose to hop over to the cursed path. Oh, you probably want to see one just just to show you what they're what they're like. Let's say I move over to the cursed path. In this case, I have to give one of my map fragments to the enemy who has the least map fragments. That stinks because uh, because I'm going to lose my ability. Let's say I give this. I have to give it to green. Green has the fewest map fragments at none. Now I only have one left, and one is not enough for me to move my captain on the path. So now I have to work hard to either steal a map fragment from another player or draw another one from the tile while there are some here. Uh, you'll notice if you've done the math, there are not enough tiles for every player to have two map fragments. Uh, and the reason is because some of them, actually this one here, I should have done something earlier. This one is a one shot. Uh, when you draw that, you gain fame and then discard it. So this ship actually gained a little bit of fame. They told a heroic tale and got some fame. So there's actually not enough map tiles that are map fragments that you can follow uh, to have two for every player. So there will be a lot of stealing and fighting over them. Uh, let's say it gets around to my last turn. I want to show you this. Um, I can either repair after I decide to move or not, uh, or shoot. <clears throat> and so let's say that we're going to take the shoot action. Oops. And so I look at the next water area. Let's say red had since moved in. Uh, I shoot every ship in that area for one. With a front attack, it's one. With a broadside attack, it's two. And so uh, red and green will each take a point of damage. And that's nice and simple. 
and then I get to roll the attack die. So I'm going to roll it. And in this case, it says a doubloon is stolen. So from each ship that took damage, I actually steal a doubloon. Kind of fell off the side of their ship while they were worried about other things. The other thing that the attack die can do is... <gasps> there's a couple blank spots. Uh, but the other thing is it can kill a crew of the ship that I just attacked. So every time you attack, whether it's a front attack or broadsides, you roll that afterwards to see if you get something from that ship uh, or kill one of their crew. Um, that's pretty good basis for the game. Uh, if a ship ever takes enough damage to go down past one, they scoot over to the um, to that last spot there, which is the ghost ship spot. And essentially your ship stays in place where it is on the board, uh, but they are counted as a ghost ship. And for those of you who will back us during our Kickstarter campaign, you're going to be uh, you're going to be thrilled to see how we're handling this. We're going to have 3D models for our ships, and we're going to have translucent uh, versions of the of the ships to actually represent ghost ships. So you take one model off that's painted in your color, and you put on your translucent uh, ship to represent that you're now a ghost ship. While you're a ghost ship, you have some limitations. You actually haunt the area that you're in, so you can only kind of turn around in the area you're in, you cannot leave the area. Um, you can't repair, but you also can't take damage. You're immune to damage because uh, you're kind of down here in the, in the ghost ship. Um, there is a way to recover from being a ghost ship, and it involves acquiring enough doubloons and then returning them. You might recognize that theme from some popular folklore. Uh, and so you can return four doubloons back to the island and recover yourself to seven hull. And now you are a full-fledged ship again. Uh, you can stay a ghost ship as long as you uh, need to to acquire the doubloons. You can even still win as a ghost ship. However, at the end of the game, when you're counting treasure, uh, ghost ships have cursed treasure on their ship. So all of their treasure and their doubloons are worth one less point. So you might have enough that that actually still um, is, is a viable way for you to win, uh, but it is difficult. At the point when one of the captains reaches Skull Mountain during the hunt process, after the pillage phase that round, we have a digging up the buried treasure. What happens is, let's say that blue got it all the way to the end there. Let's say red made it to just one spot behind, and green was two spots behind over here. And yellow didn't make it very far. So at the end of the round, at any player that has made it all the way to the end, because it can be multiple players during the same round, they will draw three jewels from the bag. So let's say it's blue, I draw one, two, three. That was a fantastic draw. Two diamonds and a ruby. Um, anyone who's one step behind, so red, they get to draw two, bag, uh, two from the bag. Got a ruby, also a diamond. And anyone that is two steps behind gets one draw from the bag. So green managed to escape with an ambulance. At that point, all the captains come back to the ship, to that crew, uh, captain track, to the top spot on the captain track. And yellow gets his, red gets his, hers. And you'll notice that on the shipboard, in that spot, it says gain a crew. Well, when your captain comes back to the ship with the landing party, or the hunting party, um, they bring back some crew. So if you had lost any crew during the course of the game, which you undoubtedly will, you actually gain one back. We also shuffle the captain cards, which I had set aside earlier. We shuffle them into the main deck of cards. So what happens is everyone is forced to discard all of their cards, even cards in their hand. Normally you'd keep the cards in your hand back in the deck. This is now a 52 card deck. 40 plus the 12 captain cards. Shuffle it all together and now everyone draws uh, from this new modified deck. You'll notice that the captain cards all look a little different. First of all they say captain at the top. They're bright yellow in this case uh, and they have an, a special instruction at the bottom that says move your captain pawn. All of the captain cards are better versions than all the other cards in the main deck. In this case, I have three options, and they all have a plus one. So if I use it for a front attack, it does two damage instead of one. If I do a broadside, it does three instead of two. 
Uh, and of course, the pillage plus one is gain two pillage tokens. Uh, some of the uh, ones with boarding actually have the ability to board and steal a jewel now. Uh, or, in fact, in this case, board and steal the ship. Now, stealing the ship is an anecdotal um, uh, concept. Uh, in the normal game, what it means is you will steal a level of fame. So if I boarded red and stole the ship, quote-unquote, red had a fame level here. Uh, he would lose that fame level, and I would gain a fame level. There is also a cutthroat version, if you want to play, as an optional way to play, which is when I use a card to steal an enemy ship, I get up out of my seat and I swap seats with that player. I literally steal their ship. I steal the ship, the damage on the ship, the crew on the ship, the map fragments, the doubloons, the jewels, everything that that ship has worked to acquire, and they acquire mine as well. So that is a very interesting way to play. Uh, it's very cutthroat. You know, you use that as you see fit with your playgroup. <clears throat> Um, but at the bottom of the captain card, you see it says, move your captain pawn. Once you have, let's say I played this one, and then this one, and then this one in the round, I've played two captain cards. After each one, I move my captain pawn down one spot on this track. Once the first player has played their third captain card, the pawn reaches the spot that says game ends. We finish that round, we do the pillage phase, and then the game is over. At that point, we count up our treasure, our loots, uh, our, our remaining crew, we factor in ghost ships and all these things, and we ultimately see who has won the game. That's a very quick and dirty of Dead Man's Doubloons. Hope you enjoy it. It's a blast. Trust us. And we look forward to seeing you at a con. We'll be at Gen Con 2017. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.